So we have that hard edged little white just in the eye right here. And I think that's the only one I want to put in. You know, over here, since this is all in the shadow, I don't want to bring in any white. You know, I'm seeing maybe a little bit on the lip. We're going to teach you something today that you've never, ever seen done. Almost can guarantee that. Corey Pitkin is my guest. Corey, what are you going to do today? Uh, today, I'm going to uh, demonstrate drawing a portrait in a medium you've probably never seen before. A medium I've never seen before. This is so exciting. Can't wait. All right, let's get this show started. Corey is an incredible, incredible artist. Uh, you can see his work. He works primarily in pastel, but you're going to learn something new today, a new form of pastel. He's also an oil painter, a fabulous portrait artist, and today he's going to do something very special for you. So let's welcome him now. Corey Pitkin, welcome to Art School Live. Hi, Eric. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. So you said you're going to do something in a new medium. Uh, this is this is very curious. Yeah, it's called uh, Pan Pastel. It's a, a relatively uh, new material that's come on the market in the past couple of years. And it's uh, a pastel without any binder to it. So it comes in a, a little plastic tub and uh, you can use uh, brushes or they make uh, these foam applicators that you, you can- have a, You have one of those tubs you can show us? I do. All right, terrific. Now, I just bought some of this at the plein air convention. I'm anxious to try it. Yeah, show it, right hold there. it up where your face is. Awesome. All you right. can see, uh, this is uh, the color I like to use when I'm doing monochrome sketches. Uh, you know, it works well with a, a tan paper and uh, I find it uh, a little reminiscent of uh, Da Vinci's red chalk drawings. So, uh, so you say it has no binder. What's the benefit of that? Well, uh, it doesn't hold itself like a stick. It uh, behaves a little bit more like paint. Yeah. Okay. And so we're going to see how you do that. That's very mm -hmm. curious today. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'd love to. All right. Terrific. Great. I'll probably be asking questions and interpreting along the way. Please do. Okay, it looks like you've got a reference photo and it, it's a little fuzzy. It is, yeah. Um, one of the benefits of this medium is uh, it, you can come at it with a very soft touch and you know, really lose edges, uh, give kind of an ethereal feeling to your drawing. Uh, so I figured it would help to um, show you what you can do if you have a reference image that maybe isn't uh, up to par. You know, this one's a little bit blurry. It has a great feel to it. And I love the emotion that I'm getting from the model, but the, the focus just isn't there, but it's still usable. All right, terrific. Okay, so let's see how you do this. Great. Very uh, so I have over here and at your top right screen, the materials I'll be using. Uh, this is the foam applicator that I mentioned. They come in a few different sizes. Um, get this on the bigger screen. Uh, I prefer the square edge one. Uh, this is uh, just the workhorse for me. I, I don't need any of the others for it. All right. Uh, you use the same one for all colors? Uh, if I'm mixing colors, then I'll need different ones or, you know, uh, things can get messy quick. But okay. since this is monochrome, it's all I need. All right. Who makes that pan pastel? It is made by uh, pan pastel themselves. They're called soft tools. Okay. All right. Terrific. Uh, so in addition to that, um, I have a woodless uh, sanguine pencil. Let's get it on camera here. Um, these are made by Create a Color. And uh, the reason I'm using this is it's the same color as the pan pastel. So I can mix up styles. I can have the softness of the pan pastel and then some line work going along with it as well. I think I bought pan pastel from Golden at their booth. I don't know if that, if they have a separate brand or if that's the brand they're using, but um, uh, anyway, be, be curious. We'll find out if other people know about other pan pastels. We have one artist, um, uh, one of our Ukraine artists who does florals in pan pastel. So let's get started. This is Great. cool. Yeah. So I'm starting with the pan pastel, just you know, loading it up a little bit. You just kind of tap the surface, pick up some on the applicator. So 
The first thing I want to focus on is the general shape of the model's head and the gesture of this pose. Just blocking in that big shape. I'm not really paying attention to any details. Well, you can control that almost better than a, a stick. Yeah, yeah. And you can, uh, get, you can be a little bit more abstract and loose. It's great for that. And, uh, you know, since it has this square tip, just changing the angle will give you very different marks. Give us an example of that. Well, if I approach it flat against the paper, you know, I get these broad, looser marks. If I load up the tip, I can get some pretty fine, sharp edges there. Oh, really nice. Really nice. I love this. I love seeing new things. <laughs> yeah, it's a great material. Um, One thing I'm curious about, I, I was looking at your website, by the way. Your work is phenomenal. I'm Thank curious you. that you have oil paintings on there and pastel, but you told me you're primarily pastel now. Can you tell me what happened? Oh, uh, <laughs> I had children. <laughs> and uh, so my painting time is not what it used to be. And I find pastel is uh, very forgiving for a busy lifestyle. Um, you know, if I have my pastels out and sitting on the palette next to me, if I only have an hour to paint, I can hop in, get an hour of work done, and then go back to my family and, you know, those obligations. You know, that's fantastic. And I, I also think uh, uh, as an oil painter, primarily, I found that sometimes I just don't have time to get into my oils, but I can grab a, a, a stick of pastel and just start working on something fast. And I like that idea. Plus, you know, I get this vibrancy for with pastel. I can't get any other way. Yeah, it's, it's a great medium. Uh, it's so much that you can do with it. Um, I'm always trying to find uh, new ways to use pastel, um, new applications for it, testing out any new materials that come onto the market, just seeing what can be done to to push the medium. Yeah. And, okay. Can you? What are you doing here? So now I'm blocking. Yeah, I have a general shape of the head that I've established, and I'm blocking in the center shadow line, so that I'll have my dark side and my light side. All right. Oh, so Barbara Tapp says, this is interesting. No scratchy sound. <laughs> you know, that old chalk on on uh, on a bulletin board kind of thing. Yeah, it, it's, it's great uh, for uh, that type of setup where, um, you know, if you if you're sensitive to that type of thing, uh, this this will really uh, save your life. <laughs> Are you using pastel paper, sanded paper? Not sanded paper. This is uh, Strathmore's toned tan paper. Okay. And it, it's a very, very smooth paper. Uh, there's hardly any tooth to it at all. And that's the type of paper I like to work on when I'm using pan pastels because it uh, gives me the ability to wipe out some of the pastel. I can get some very soft edges, uh, which you know, you'll see as I get farther along with it, um, that there'll be a lot of edges that I can you know, really just blow out completely and uh, it gives a really nice effect. So I have a bit of the facial structure set here. Now that I've established that, I'm just going to fill in some of these other spots. I, I think this needs to grow a bit now that I've figured out the scale of the face, the, the hair and uh, scarf needs to be a little bit larger. Sarah Chavot says, hey, Corey, I took an awesome class with you at Arlene's in 2016. Oh, great. Yeah, Arlene's is uh, our local art supply store in the New York's Capital District. Uh, I used to do a lot of work with them, um, teaching workshops. That, that, and uh, so it's a great place to Albany? Yes. Yeah, Albany's uh, our closest major city. Yeah, you live up in the uh, 
in the southern part of the Adirondacks, I, we were talking before we went live, and we're going to have to get together and do some painting. Absolutely. Maybe we can hire a, you come up here and we'll hire a, somebody to model. That sounds great to me. Yeah. We'll do pan pastel portraits together. <laughs> sure. You know, I think having a fuzzy reference is actually kind of nice because then you don't have to squint. <laughs> exactly. You know, all of that simplification's already been done for you. Oh, we have somebody watching from Ningbo, China, Daniela. All right. Welcome. You guys, tell us where you're watching from. So can you wipe this out if you need to, or can, is it? You can't. Um, so I can use a paper towel to soften the edges. I can also, coming in with a kneaded eraser, Ireland. I can bring it in to almost the full paper color. Really? Uh, especially if I use, um, so this is a, a mono zero eraser made by Tombow. And right. um, it's a little vinyl eraser with a very fine tip. And, uh, you know, I can use that for adding details, but, you know, I can also really bring this down almost entirely. To I would have color. never guessed. Catherine Hockning says, I've never tried any pastels. Glad I'm here today. Well, Catherine, you're seeing a new kind of pastels being used. Very few people even know about them yet. And pastels. Yeah, it's a great material for uh, when you don't have a lot of time to spend on a sketch or uh, if you just need to travel light. Yeah, I pretty much developed this technique uh, going to open studio sessions, working from a live model where, you know, I didn't want to bring an entire oil paint or pastel set up with me. Just wanted to keep it simple, throw some things in the car and be ready to go. Nice. If you guys are watching, uh, make sure you put a comment in the comment section. We have a prize today. Um, I'm sure the prize will appear on the screen momentarily so we know what, what the prize is because I don't have a clue. But, uh, oh, okay. We're going to give away a pair of value specs that help you see values. Um, and so just leave a comment and you have a chance to win a pair of value specs. All right. Thank you. So it's just using a, a paper blending stump to, uh, soften some of these edges, especially in these rounder parts in the forehead. Will you hold yeah. that up so everybody can see it in case they sure. don't know what that is? Okay. Yeah. And as you can see, it, it's uh, well used, a well loved uh, supply in my studio. Nice. So, really, you're using a lot of drawing tools an eraser and a stump? Yeah. Very nice. Hey, we have somebody tuning in from South India. Welcome. And Indiana. India, another one from India. <laughs> uh, Pam says your, your painting is drawing, uh, developing quickly. <laughs> no, thanks, Pam. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very responsive material. So, uh, you, know, you, you can you can bring something together in in pretty short order. Well, I uh, I bought a bunch of pan pastels at the plein air convention for my daughter Grace, who was interested in them. Uh, I'm now I've got to figure out if she brought them up here to the Adirondacks, because I'm going to drag them out and borrow them. <laughs> 
I highly recommend them. Well, there was so much cool stuff for sale at the convention. Always get nice to see stuff you don't always see in the stores, especially all the plein air stuff. We sold about, um, I think, about 70 or 75% of the next year's plein air convention seats already because <clears throat> we had to limit it because of where we're going. We're going to the Smoky Mountains, and uh, uh, about 60% of them bought them. People that were at the convention bought them right there, and then right after, a bunch more people. So we, we really aren't going to have a lot of seats left. It's pretty cool. You don't do plein air painting, though, do you? Uh, I don't do it well. <laughs> uh, well, you come up here and we'll we'll work on it together. I know you've got a family. That, that takes time. I used to, when my kids would go to ball games and things, I'd take my paintings and and I'd set up uh, and paint while they're doing their stuff. Or usually, if I had to pay attention, I wasn't. But I'd take them on scout outings. And that way, uh, I got to paint, too. That's a great idea. And I had I had a baby monitor hooked up to my uh, my easel. I go out in the backyard or the front yard. I lived at where there's a beautiful view, and uh, then I'd let, while they're taking naps, I'd be painting. Hello, Alex in Brazil. Can you tell us what you're up to here? Well, right now I have an eye here that I'm generally happy with. So I'm trying to get this eye on the left to, to match it structurally while I'm also defining the nose a little bit more. It's kind of a, a push and pull between those two, getting this area to, to solidify. Really a question thing. from um, Alka. Do you always do the base value sketch uh, with the brown color? Uh, for a full color pastel, no. Um, I usually just will will dive in with full color. Um, but for this technique, uh, this is the, the color I prefer to use. It's uh, a red iron oxide, and uh, I, I find it a little reminiscent of uh, da Vinci's red chalk paintings. Yeah, he'd be, he'd be proud of you. <laughs> I think this is a, you know, taking on portraiture, this is a really a great place to start because uh, once you add color, it just complicates everything. Start out by drawing and then uh, start out trying something like this, either with pencil or um, crayon and then, um, or past pastels. Because once you start adding color, it just makes everything more complicated. Absolutely. couple bits here. I'm going to tighten up just a little. I don't want it, since this white of the eye is in the shadow, I don't want it to uh, overpower the dark tones around it. But I do want the eye to be a little more front and center than it currently is. So what tool are you using there? Uh, this is the Mono Zero Eraser by Tombow. Oh, so it's in the shape of a pencil. Yeah, it, and it's a very fine point, and you know you can get an even finer point just by you know, rubbing it on the paper until it's almost a, a needle point for oh. uh, for something like. A, I guess I need to drive down to Albany and get me some of those. <laughs> Last I knew, Arlene's did happen. Shout out to Arlene's. Yeah, Arlene's going to get a lot of business for all the people in upstate New York watching. Let's hope. Got to support our our local art suppliers. Boy, I agree with that. We, you know, I I, whenever possible, I drive to the art store. I buy a lot of stuff online, but 
whenever possible. I try to usually in Austin, I'm, I'm there once a week. I run out of colors. I go there just because I like to browse and see what's new. So tell me again, that's called a Tombow. Yeah, Tombow is the manufacturer, and this is the Mono Zero okay. eraser. They make a, a wedge-shaped one as well. Um, I just personally don't find that one uh, as useful for, for the way I draw. I, I will post a link to Amazon for that Tombow Mono Zero. So I have the eyes set figuring out the exact angle of the nose here so I can keep bringing it down and uh, start to tackle the mouth. So. so there's a question from Mary Talbot who says, are pan pastels less dusty and safer? Well, I can't speak to the safety. Um, you know, you would definitely need to uh, check with somebody a little more educated on it than I am. But as far as the dust content, um, I've noticed there's hardly any. Well, that would that would indicate safer because the big issue a lot of people have with pastel is breathing all the dust from all the scrubbing that takes place. A lot of people wear masks. A lot of people have um, systems that collect the dust. A lot of them will take a wet paper towel and put it at the base of their painting so it dro the dust drops on it and stays there. Yeah, I've tried all of those over the years. Um, these days, I, I'm just running an air filter uh, in my studio, and that, that seems to, to do a fair job. So Tammy Hickey says, what times I have done pastel, I think I've done it very well. My problem is that I end up back with my other mediums. I spent some time with pastel, could probably do well, but... Um, uh, oh, and she goes on about her Mono Zero thing. Tammy, um, we have Pastel Live coming up in August, which is a, uh, we have a one-day essentials day for beginners, and then we have a three-day event uh, with some of the world's leading artists, including Corey, and uh, they're going to be teaching. So if you really want to double down on Pastel, this would be the great way, because you'll see all the different techniques, approaches, styles, um, and it's really about what you'd spend if you went out to dinner and got a bottle of wine, so it's not very expensive, especially for four days of content. So I'm trying to treat the mouth simply. I don't want to, uh, you know, just put a line across the face, or you know, even follow the the various contours of the mouth. I find if I can break it up, you know, just let parts of it. Uh, bleed away and just let some of the mouth be implied. Uh, you get a, a far more powerful expression. I'm finding that if you keep things softer, they read better. Absolutely. Yeah. We try to, we had tend to over define things. <laughs> we're, we're all our own worst enemies, not the easel. So you were just down uh, at the American Impressionist or Pastel, what was it, the American Pastel Society event, right? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, the the Pastel Society of America uh, had their their big annual uh, exhibit, and uh, plus there is the IAPS, which is the uh, International Association of Pastel Societies, uh, and they have a, a huge uh, biannual convention. Yeah, they're not doing one this year. No, but they'll have one again next year. Um, great organizations. Absolutely, yeah. It's really important for people to join groups, become part of uh, societies or groups, because that way you find other people that you can relate to. 
yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, you may not always find um, your tribe as it is uh, locally. So uh, these larger organizations can be a, a great resource when uh, you, know, you want to meet like-minded artists. So at um, this point, I'm just uh, filling in some of these larger dark areas, uh, and that'll really help set off what I've already established here in the face by framing it and uh, you know, adding a, a bit of an air of mystery to the whole thing. And this also gives me a good opportunity to check my proportions in the hair, uh, you know, hair can be tricky because there aren't uh, reference points like there are, say, on the face, where you can easily measure between the eye and the nose and establish the distance there. The hair, it's largely a nebulous mass, so um, I find it, it takes a, a couple of attempts before I, I get it where I'm happy with it. Yeah, Max Ginsburg told me something. He said when he paints hair, he does not paint strokes in the direction that we normally do. He would make them more horizontal. Yeah, like he instead of going down, he'd go across. Uh -huh. That's just a preference thing for him. Yeah, I, I think it helps to establish that that big shape, and uh, you know, to really give the entire portrait uh, presence. Yeah. I'm letting a lot of the edges between her face and the hair just bleed together. Well, the, you know, the mark of a true pro are their edges. <laughs> I, I think it's an underused technique. Um, you know, there's so much you can say with edges that, um, you know, it, it's, you can imply the anatomy of something, um, you know, add, add an air of, um, you know, I think what Andrew Wyeth called, you know, mystery or the, the Halloween of the piece, uh, you know, something that will intrigue the viewer. And uh, I think especially something with a lot of lost edges, um, you're trusting your viewer to be able to figure out what you've drawn and uh, you're engaging them a little bit more, you know, because it's not as straightforward. They have to look deeper into your piece. Okay, Kathy Teasdale says, I'm watching from a Subway restaurant having a quick salad as fast uh, as I, you can chew lettuce without choking on it. <laughs> Kathy, I want you to stand up in Subway and say, hey, everybody, I'm watching Art School Live at a worldwide audience, and you can learn to paint. Let's see if you have the courage to do it. All right. If she says she did it, I'm going to give her a reward. <laughs> especially since it's our first day back for a while. Okay, waiting to hear from her. So could you, if you decided, if you wanted to spice it up and add a little color to it, how difficult would it be? Would you just put the color on the light side or what would you do? Well, there's enough tooth to where I could put the color on the dark side and you know still let some of this show through. So it would uh, be a little bit like with an oil painting if you have an underpainting and uh, you're letting some of that show through, especially in the shadows, that, that helps to harmonize the entire piece. What are you gonna do on Pastel Live? On Pastel Live, I'm going to be doing a full color portrait Ah, which, great. Uh, so we'll get yeah. a chance to see that. That's going to mm -hmm. be interesting. Yeah, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Um, I, I use a, a palette that uh, I've invented that uh, leans heavy on uh, earth tones and chromatic grays uh, to get flesh tones. Yeah. Uh, just for the benefit of everybody tuning in, I just want to show everybody a little bit of your work because to see some, some finished work, let me see if I can find it here. Um, there we go. Uh, that's just beautiful. Is that your son? 
It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's my youngest. How many kids? Two. Two. Yeah. Uh, some of my older pieces uh, have my daughter, but uh, as she's approaching uh, her teen years, she doesn't want to sit for dad anymore. Yeah. Uh, I never did. Dad, I don't want to sit. <laughs> Get them while you can or else you're doing photographs. Yep. Even sitting for the photograph can be tough. I get it. <laughs> well, bribery works very well. It does, yeah. So now you're using the crayon. This is the, the blending stump. Uh, just, oh, it is the blending yeah. stump. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, just bringing some of that tone over into the lips so that they're a little more defined. Uh, this kind of implies the color of the lips without having to bring uh, additional color in. And, you know, just in general, softening up some edges. I'm going to uh, break out that Tombow eraser again. Let's see if I can put a little bit of texture in the lips here. Yeah, and we're going to put a link to that on the on uh, on Amazon right now. If you can buy it from a local art store, go do that. But this way, I I don't I can't drive to Albany, so and I <laughs> yeah, want mine tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, Albany's got to be a hike for you. Kathy Teasdale says she's going to watch this one several times. Yeah, that's very helpful. I need to get one of those uh, pan pastel uh, square tips. I don't have one of those. Yeah, I've tried all of the shapes, and this is definitely my favorite. Uh, Catherine says, do they have a starter kit? I think you, they do. Uh, I, think I so. bought a starter kit, actually, with two different sets of colors. and But you can buy them individually, too. If you want to just buy you know, one or two just to try it out, I think that's a good idea. Um, Corey, tell everybody again, Joyce wants to know the kind of paper you're using because she came in late. Corey? Or sure. uh, I, I mean, Joyce, don't be late again. <laughs> You're going to be in trouble. I'm going to dock your pay. Uh, the paper I'm using is Strathmore's Toned Tan. Uh, it, it's a pretty readily available uh, paper. You can get these spiral-bound books in uh, most craft stores that have okay. an art supply section. Paul Barisic says, if you love to draw, you're going to love pastels. I agree. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, drawing was my first love. So when I when I found pastel, I I knew I was home. So I also have a, a pastel pencil here, and this is uh, made by Derwent. Uh, the color is pale olive, and um, I'm just going to use that to bring a little bit of highlight in here. Uh, I prefer this pale olive to, say, a white because it's going to be more subtle. Uh, white might be a little, uh, just too much contrast between the paper and and the mark I'm going to put on. So it's a pass, it's a pale olive? Yeah. And it matches the paper color rather closely. but it does help to uh, build up that form. I can layer it on top of the pan pastel. So you know, I can kind of cut into uh, to what's already there, put this on top. And unless you get up close, it really comes very close to matching that paper color. Is there a reason you don't use uh, pastel paper? Uh, for the pan pastels, I like this um, very smooth paper because the pan pastel glides across it. And I can use the pan pastel almost like paint. Yeah, so that's that way you're not getting that scratchy sound, too. Right. Uh, when I do a full color pastel, then I do use uh, 
pastel paper. You do? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to see that on Pastel Live. And we have we have a lot of the manufacturers going to be selling their products. I will have to reach out to the Pan Pastel people. Trying to get some of these really dark darks here in this transition area. And I'm just, you know, keep layering that pan pastel on. Um, I find, you know, if you have a pan pastel that you're drawing that you like, uh, it responds well to using a fixative, whereas, uh, you know, a lot of full color pastels do not. What do you mean? Uh, a lot of times, especially if you're using a, a highly textured uh, pastel paper that has, you know, a, a real sandpaper tooth to it, when you spray a fixative on top of it, that pushes the pigment into the tooth of the paper and everything darkens on you instantly. Um, so I don't use fixative on my full color pastels. Uh, I just, uh, I'll put it down a piece of newsprint and uh, then just press down on it while rubbing my hand across. And that will push the pigment into the tooth without flattening everything and, and darkening the paper. And um, that that's held up well for me. You know, I have uh, pieces that are at least 15 years old that uh, look as good as they did on day one. Cool. Yeah, a lot of people will say they're going to watch it again. That's a good idea. Watching again is a good idea. So, how it if we had to stop soon, how much longer would you typically work on something like this? Uh, well, it would really depend on what my goal was for it. Um, you know, if this were a sketch, it would probably be done within the next few minutes. Yeah. Um, if it were a commission or something that, you know, I was going uh, larger scale, well, then it would have a few more days. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. If you guys like this, give Corey a thumbs up or an applause or a heart or something, a smile. Uh, we like to encourage our guests. Dolores Testerman says, I've watched some of your videos at least 10 times. Okay, Dolores, you're awesome. Yes, thank you, Dolores. Always good to know that the work is appreciated. Absolutely. Hey, you guys watching, tell us what you're doing right now other than watching. Like, where are you? Are you home? Are you in Subway? Paul Barrick says, I start my day with Eric. Paul, you're starting your day at noon? You sleep late, do you? We have, of course, um, the, the videos we do on this daily show are the artists working out of their homes uh, from their own cameras and their own setup. But we also have PaintTube.tv, which we have hundreds of professionally produced, high definition, really high quality, um, big professional cameras in a sound stage. We do it all, all up really well. So if you're interested in that, let's go to PaintTube.tv. And I think we have a free gift for everybody today. If you're watching uh, and you don't have a free gift, well, let's, let's get you one. Um, we have a free video for you, and all you got to do is it gives you, um, oh, here's pastel pointers from the pros, 45 pastel tips at pastellive.com slash 45 tips. All right. Yeah.
If you are not a subscriber of this program, you can subscribe on YouTube. Just go to Art School Live and subscribe and hit the little bell. That way you get notification. And if you'll give a follow on Instagram at Eric Rhodes. I'm also now on uh, Twitch. Who's on? Did I say Twitch? <laughs> Threads. Who's on Threads now? Uh, it's like, oh, man, we have to do more stuff. So now I'm posting daily on Threads, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Ah, it's getting tedious. But you got to be where people are. Okay, Jay Toro says, usually if I have the materials while watching one of these, I do a small version of the live artist to help me physically understand the live demo. Of course, it's never as great, but yay, I like it. Good. I'm tempted to do that myself, but it's kind of hard to talk and chew gum at the same time. I can barely do that. You guys give me a follow on threads at Eric Rhodes. I decided this morning, actually, I'm going to start uh, doing some philosophy on threads that I don't do anywhere else. Some just some thoughts about um, painting, so just to be different. Matter of fact, I'm going to post one as soon as this is over. So go to threads. Uh, if you're not on threads, you're on Instagram. Just open up a threads account. It's automatically transferred. Although, please know they are scraping your data, all these places. They're just taking all your data. Corey, that's looking good, man. Thanks, Eric. So will you ever go back in with, uh, you said you, you went in with the olive pencil. You would never use white then. You, you get your highlights with the olive? Uh, I might, you know, just to, there's a little catch light right in the eye there that, um, actually, yeah, let me grab a white. Um, right. Hey, Corey's grabbing white. This is play by play. So I have that hard edged little white just in the eye right here. And I think that's the only one I want to put in, you know, over here, since this is all in the shadow, I don't want to bring in any white. You know, I'm seeing maybe a little bit on the lip. Yeah, why not? So Robert Henry and his book uh, talks about highlights on the eyes. And he says he only would highlight one eye, not two, because if you did two, it made the person look stupid. His words, not mine. <laughs> I never found that to be the case. I usually do highlights in both eyes, but then again, my paintings kind of look stupid. Yeah, I've never heard that. Um, I, I do recall from studying uh, the work of Velasquez that uh, he would make sure that they were not the same in the two eyes because you know one is definitely going to be closer to the light source. So you don't want to put the same highlight in both eyes. Yeah, I'm going to go see Velasquez. I'm taking a group uh, on my annual fine art trip, but we haven't been able to do it in four years. Taking a group to Stockholm and then to Madrid, four days each. And uh, we're going to do Velasquez and Soroya and uh, Anders Zorn and all the greats. Uh, just have an incredible trip behind the scenes. It's going to be terrific. That's at finearttrip.com. That sounds amazing. It's going to be terrific. I'm going to have a busy year this year because I'm going to be, I got uh, Pastel Live, then I got Fall Color Week, and then I got the European trip, and then we got Realism Live, and then we have Watercolor Live, and then we have Pastel Live, or a uh, Plein Air Live, and then I take a group to Japan, a painting trip, and then we have the Plein Air Convention, and then we start all over again. It's crazy. That's a beautiful portrait. Thank you. All right. I think what we'll do, Corey, is once you come back on screen so everybody can see you and we're going to wrap it up, uh, there's a lot more I'm sure you could do to develop it, but let's uh, let everybody meet you if they didn't see you in the beginning. All right. Our guest today is Corey Pitkin. Corey, nice job. Thank you so much. 
No, thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Do you have any final thoughts on uh, use of pan pastels so that people can try them out? Um, stick with a smooth paper. You know, the smoother, the better. You don't want something with a lot of texture to it. And uh, first and foremost, have fun. Have fun. All right. And what's your best advice to somebody who wants to learn how to do portraiture? Study the greats. Um, you know, we brought up Velasquez. Uh, you can learn everything you need to know about portraiture just by going through the Velasquez section at a good museum. Okay. And take your pad and paper and try to copy them, I suppose. Absolutely. Just don't bring pan pastel. They won't let you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not yet, but we, we got to make a mainstream and then everybody will want to do it. All right. Let's do it. Ori, thank you so much for being on.